Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. Uh, since then, of course, one of the uh, sponsoring pastors of this meeting, Brother Steve Pixler, um, we go way back, way back to whenever he was 16 and um, first started in, in the ministry, preaching for us there in Ocala. And um, I appreciate Brother Pixler so very, very much. Thank God. I want to tell some young folks that are here tonight, you don't have to wait until you're 35 to do something for God. You can start right now. I read a proverb the other day that said the best time to have planted a tree was 20 years ago said the second best time is right now so you don't have to wait until you've got years behind you and I remember as a matter of fact this coming year will mark uh, 40 years of ministry I started preaching when I was 16 years old and uh, this coming year will be 40 years this year I I guess we are in 2009 so I will be 56 in April and um, I I realize I don't look that old thank you so much you're so kind I appreciate that I could just feel that I could hear some folks say he don't look 56 you're so good you're so kind I'm really going to enjoy preaching to you tonight I do that and my wife looks at me when I get in the vehicle and she says, have you looked in the mirror lately? (laughs) Amen. But it's been a great journey. And I looked around here tonight and thought about, Brother Burgess, I thought about how many of these young people are 20 years of age and younger. And, uh, And I think they were not even born we're not even born yet when I took the church in Ocala 25 years ago but what excites me is the fact we're not standing in a half empty auditorium and it only filled with gray hairs but I look across and see young people and you look so good it's obvious your pastors love you enough to preach to you train you and teach you in the ways of truth I know you're standing, but I'll be standing longer than you tonight, so just bear with me here a moment. Um, I think often about the time that Abraham sent his servant to get a bride for Isaac. And his instructions were that if she's not willing to come with you, leave her where she is. Don't come back and get Isaac and take him down to where she is and uh, young people you need to always remember that God's not going to come to where you are in all reality he's looking for you to come to where he is to where his word is but the servant went and of course you know the story she made that long trek from where she was to where Isaac was and the scripture says that Whenever the the servant got Rebecca close enough, it said that she lifted up her eyes and she saw Isaac in the field. And Isaac also lifted up his eyes and he saw Rebecca. And the scripture says that she met him, they met together, and he took her into Sarah's tent. It's obvious at that point that the servant stepped aside because his job was finished his job was complete he had brought the bride to the bridegroom and I would just like to say tonight that every time a preacher gets up to preach the word of the Lord he's taking you on a journey to give you another look at Jesus Christ 
And when he has brought you to the fullness of that message and you have seen the Lord the way he wants you to see him in that message, then it's up to you to get with him and take care of business. I fear sometime that you wait on someone else to help you get there once the preacher has gotten you there. But we need to learn as young people how to touch God when we're 13, when we're 15, when we're 18, when we're 19, how to get a hold of God for ourselves. Hallelujah. Let me get in the word of the Lord tonight, the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 17. It is, I know, one of the most preached from, most familiar passages of scripture in all of the word of God but this is what I feel tonight and so this is what I'm going to preach and I hope you help me I don't want to preach this by myself I feel like there's such a power of God in this place and I'm not going to preach long I hope I I don't intend to it's always a dangerous thing for a preacher to say I don't intend to preach a long time, and this may appear to some to be a thimble deep and a yard wide, but that's fine. That's how I feel, what I feel tonight. This is what I'm going to preach. 1 Samuel 17 and 31, when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. David said to Saul, your servant kept his father's sheep. There came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and he slew him. And thy servant slew both the lion and the bear in this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And Saul armed David with his armor, put a helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor. And he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with thee, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. Verse 40, notice. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine, and the Philistine came on and drew near to David and the man that bare the shield went before him verse 40 he took his staff in his hand chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put him in a shepherd's bag my subject tonight my title is simply this more than enough amen more than enough would you pray right now that the Holy Ghost will help us in the preaching of the word of the Lord tonight, that our hearts will be open and receptive. Come on, let's talk to him. Hallelujah, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Praise God. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. Talk to us tonight in this house. Let your word be real to us. Let it minister to our hearts. Let there be a strengthening in the spirit tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody in the house shout hallelujah. Come on, everybody in the house shout hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated if you're going to help me tonight. Amen. Looks like 100% participation. David's testimony to Saul In verse 37 was simply this. The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. 
Amen. David was not a fool, even as a young man. As a young lad, he understood that he was no match for a lion and he was no match for the bear. He understood that he also was not a match for the giant. His testimony was it was God. He did not entertain any thoughts that he was capable of doing it on his own. To all of those tonight that are in this house that consider yourself to be a young person. I am 56 years old. Brother Calhoun has a number of years behind him as well as all of these pastors. None of us tonight believe that you are able to do it by yourself. And neither do we expect you to think that you can do it by yourself. We've been down the road long enough and we understand very clearly that we are only where we are tonight because of the hand of a mighty God that has kept us, that has led us, and that has brought us to where we are today. Hallelujah. David understood it. He learned it as a young man that he was no match for the lion. He said it was God that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. And he had this confidence and this faith in a great God that his God was more than enough to also deliver him from the hand of Goliath. It would be God who would make up the difference. Hallelujah. I'm here today to tell you it matters not what your insufficiencies are. God makes the difference. It matters not what your weaknesses are. God makes the difference. It doesn't matter what your failures are. God makes the difference. We understand that there are times in our life when we come up against things that we are no match for them. But that is when all of us in the house begin to rely upon a God who is more than enough. Hallelujah. I read in the book of Romans and it makes me realize that this Holy Ghost that he has given to us is more than just a spine tingling tongue talking experience. But Paul said likewise the spirit also helpeth our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered you need to thank god that there is a spirit that resides within your very soul that when you find yourself struggling with your infirmities with your weaknesses with your failures that there's a spirit inside of you that begins to make intercession for you with groanings that cannot be uttered thank god for the holy ghost you hear me i said again thank god for the holy ghost he went on to say in that same chapter Verse 31, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I want to encourage a young generation tonight that I've been down the road for 40 years. I was born in Pentecost. I was raised in Pentecost. I've got a good word for you tonight. If God be for you, who can be against you oh hallelujah he not only said those words but verse 35 who shall separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword verse 37 nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us hallelujah 
turn around to somebody close to you and say, I'm more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then he went on in verse 38. He said, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth you don't hear me tonight nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord hallelujah Paul writes in 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 and 10 he talked about God who has delivered us from so great a death and death deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us hallelujah i'm talking about a god tonight that brought you out of darkness a god that set you free from the bondages of sin and death and that god that has delivered you from so great a death he is delivering you right now right now right now in this house tonight in this winter heritage he is delivering you and because we know he has delivered and because we know that he is delivering we also know that there's nothing ahead nothing before us that our god will not deliver us from Hallelujah. The book of Jude, the apostle writes, Now unto him, somebody say unto him, God is more than enough. Oh, hallelujah. I don't care where you're coming from, he's more than enough. I don't care what you've been through, he's more than enough. I don't care what kind of lion you're facing, he's more than enough. It doesn't matter the ugly bears of sin that haunt your life. He's more than enough. If you're standing facing a Goliath tonight, he's more than enough. Jude said, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God the only true God be the glory because it will be he who will present you faultless But you might say, but you don't understand, Brother Bass. I've already fallen. I've already had problems. Well, let me tell you what the prophet of old said. That ought to be the cry of your heart. In Micah 7 and 8, rejoice not against me. Oh, mine enemy, when I fall, I shall arise. And though I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me <laughs> hallelujah come on you want to look around yourself and realize how weak you really are the song that we've sung of old said I'm no match for the devil on my own I fail every time and then we reach back to first john 4 and 4 when he said you are of little ch of god little children and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world i said greater 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 is he that's in you 
He's more than enough. He's more than enough. He's more than enough. David said, I'm telling you right now, Saul, it was God that brought me through. It was God that kept me out of the lion's mouth and the bear's mouth. And I'm telling you now, my God's more than enough to help me and to deliver me from the bondage of a Goliath. Oh, hallelujah. You can be seated. And so... Because he knew that his God was more than enough. He went down to the brook. When he essayed to wear the armor of King Saul. Because he had not proven that. And he went down by the brook. And at the brook, he found five smooth stones to use in the fight. Amen. Amen. Now, thank God for the brook. But something else David understood about the brook was there was more than just water at the brook. (laughs) There was more than just water in the stream. He also knew that at the brook, there were some things that he could pick up that would help him in the fight. That it would help him in the struggle. The day that you learn that church is more than a blessing. It's more than a shout. And thank God for the water that's in the brook. And thank God for the blessing that's in the church. But when you find out that there's something more in the house of God than just a blessing. You leave here with your pocket full of rocks, not to throw at one another, but to find you a giant somewhere. David was fleeing for his life. He went by the house of God. He asked the priest, what is under your hand? And the priest said, there's nothing here, but there's no common bread. All there is is hallowed bread. And so David said to Abimelech, he said, I want some of this bread. And he said, have you kept yourself clean? He said, we have. He said, well, here, you can have some of the hallowed bread. Oh, yeah. Thank God for the bread that's at the house of the Lord. Amen. David found out if I go by the house of God, then there's something there that will sustain me, that will strengthen me. But while he was there, he also said, is there a spear or a sword in this place? I have neither brought sword nor my weapons with me. And the priest said that there is a sword back here and there's none like it in all of the earth. And the Bible said he went back and this sword was wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. And he went back to that ephod, which was a holy garment. It was a holy place. And he got a sword out that was none like it in all the land and put it in the hand of David and said, take it and use it for whatever's necessary. I'm telling you tonight that when you come to church, there's more than just bread. But when you're in a struggle, your pastor knows how to put a sword in your hand, a weapon that's been in a holy place. You'll never fight this spiritual battle with carnal means. The carnal mind is enmity with God. Carnality in flesh does not avail anything in the work of the kingdom and in the fight for faith and of faith. But when you recognize that there's something in the house beside a blessing, there's something in church beside a tongue-talking experience, but I can find some things uh, that will help me fight, that will help me war, a good warfare, that will help me fight the fight of faith. 
Preacher, give me a sword. I got a battle to fight. Preacher, put something in my hand that'll help me go out and be victorious for God. And so, they would learn some things about the brook that he put into action. He found the five smooth stones. Now, there's been a lot of conjecture through the years with regards to the fact of why five stones. Some have likened it to faith, F-A-I-T-H, G-R-A-C-E, grace. Some have even used the word Jesus in relation to it. And then there were those that surmised the fact that David knew that Goliath had four brothers. But I kind of have a hard time with that particular viewpoint because he had to ask, who is this? So if he didn't even know who Goliath was, how did he know he had four brothers? Amen. And so tonight everybody else has preached their little viewpoint. I'm going to preach mine. I just something tells me in my spirit here that 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 and, and this is my personal observation, but when David went by that brook, he knew that his God was more than enough. He knew that his God could do the work. He didn't have any doubt about the greatness and the power of his God. But in gathering the five stones from the brook, although he knew that all it would take was one in the right place, there was something about David that said, I want more than enough. I want more than just enough to kill the giant. I want more than just enough to get by. My God is more than enough. But I made my mind up that when I get by the brook, I'm going to get enough stones uh, for this battle and for some more battles that I may not even know I'm going to fight. Herein lies a problem in our time. And that is so often we only get enough to help us survive the one battle that we're facing. Amen. Amen. We get an idea, and that is, I get just enough to make it to next Sunday. I get just enough to make it to Wednesday night Bible study. I get just enough to survive where I am. But I've come to preach to some fake people at, at Winter Heritage. I want more than enough to just survive. I've got to have a Holy Ghost revival. I've got to see a divine manifestation of God's power and God's glory. When we come to church, we need to learn how to get more than enough. More than enough just to go from service to service. More than enough to just go from this trial to the next trial. More than enough to fight and win. God, amen, I want more than just enough to deal with parents that are not saved. Or I want to be more, have more than just enough to contend with some carnal young people in my youth group. I believe there's some young folks going to get a hold of something here tonight. Before you leave Winter Heritage, you're going to make up your mind from this time forth, even forevermore. Every time I go to the house of worship, I'm not going to get just enough to fill up. I'm going to get enough to get out there and do something for God. To make a mark in my world. To impact my generation. To reach those who are of my age. Amen. Here's the kind of example I like to talk about. Peter and John went up to the temple 
at the hour of prayer. They were on their way to church. And on their way to church, they met a man who said, alms please. And they said, look on us. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. What are you saying? I'm telling you that Peter and John had more power on the way to church than some folks have when they leave church. Come on now. Woo. I don't want to just have enough power. I don't want to just have enough God that gets me back to church. But I want enough that while I'm on my way to church, I can help somebody get in there where I am. I can break my God. My God, hallelujah. Come on. Come on. I want more than enough to get myself back. I want enough to bring somebody with me. I'm going to have to stay focused tonight. I'll get on a sidetrack here. Huh? Come on, young man. Come on, young lady. I'm going to tell you again, and please forgive the personal reference. Amen. But I'm going to tell you, I started evangelizing full-time when I was 16 years old. I understand that's not for everybody. I understand it's a special situation. I know. I would never recommend that for my for others. I, I know that. However, I'm going to tell you something. Amen. It was the will of God, and I made my mind up when I was 16 years old. I'm not walking this road by myself. By the help and the grace of God, I've seen the blinded eyes open. I've watched God heal people of miraculous, or did do miraculous things in people's lives. I've seen young people get the Holy Ghost all over this nation. I've been in foreign countries uh, preaching this glorious gospel. Uh, hundreds and thousands. Uh, Ethiopia, Brazil, uh, Haiti, and other nations. Uh, what are you saying? I'm telling you, you got to get it in your mind. Uh, I'm doing more. I'm getting more. I'm getting more. I'm getting more than enough. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be so selfish that all I want is enough for myself. Huh? Just forget about those carnal bunch that when you walk by, they sneer and say, well, there goes Holy Joe. There goes holier than thou. Huh? Hey, Amen. Forget about them. I said forget about them. You need to go down by the gate beautiful and get a hold of you somebody and bring them on in the church. Hallelujah. Shouting with you. Dancing with you. Praising God with you. Glorifying God because of what God has done for them through your testimony, through your witness, through your prayer, through. Ooh. 
what would happen? I said, what would happen to Winter Heritage? What would happen to Winter Heritage if every young person in this house this year made up in your mind, I'm leaving Winter Heritage tonight. I'm going to get more than enough for myself. I'm going to win somebody to the kingdom of God this year. I'm going to see somebody get the Holy Ghost. I'm going to give a Bible study. I'm going to do whatever I can do. Amen. And next year, when I come to Winter Heritage, hallelujah, next year when I come to Winter Heritage, I'm going to bring mine with me. Hallelujah. I'm going to bring that one I won. I'm going to bring that soul that I won to Jesus Christ. This building won't be big enough. You'll need another building to house it. Hey, I'm not trying to hype you up. I'm trying to tell you that when you get beyond yourself, Uh -huh. I said, when you get beyond yourself, how many of you got automobiles to drive? Let me see your hand. Come on, hold your hands up. If you got, if you're a young person, you got an automobile to drive. You know what you ought to be doing on your way to church? Amen. You ought to be looking. See if you can find somebody in a pretty place with an ugly problem. See if you can find somebody, come on now, in trouble. <laughs> huh? Oh, but I don't know if I can have anything to do with that individual. It looks to me like they hadn't had a bath in several days. It just might be that that individual is just waiting on someone to stop where they are and say, look, I don't have, I don't have what you need or what you want, but I got what you need. I know a Jesus. I know a Jesus. Amen. Be seated. Praise the Lord. Now, one of the things that that uh, we are one of the things we're dealing with today is this. And I understand I'm the only thing between you and a lock-in. But that's our problem. We come to church on our way home. Or we go to church on our way to the hamburger stand. Or we go to church on our way to the pizza parlor. Or we go to the... Ch did anybody come here tonight on your way to a lock-in? Or did you come to church... God likes to do things. Let me tell you how God likes to do things. He's got 5,000 men beside women and children that are hungry. Been out in the hot sun all day. It's time to go home. The disciples said, as a matter of fact, said it's time to go. We need to go home. We need to send a crowd. Let's disperse this crowd. The sun is setting. The time has now passed. It's time to go home. And that's, that's the attitude of a lot of people in our world today. That we're at the end time. It's time to go home. Send the crowd away. Oh, hallelujah. Let's get rid of the crowd. Let's send them on home. The sun is setting. And I'm telling you, the sun is setting on Pentecost. The shadows are long. 
Acts chapter 2, the sun was rising and the shadows were long toward the west. Tonight, it's the, it's the shadows from the west back to the east that are long and Pentecost is wrapping up. And there's a few folks in our world who are afraid more than, not more than what we want to admit that have got an attitude of us four and no more. We're going to do good if we hang on to the youth group we've got. We're going to do good if we just kind of hang around here and, 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 and form our own little clique, our own little group. And we'll be fewer, but we'll be pure. No, friend, that's not the way Jesus works. I am convinced that this very miracle he performed, he did it for a reason. He performed it because he wanted us in Pentecost at the end of the road to realize that he's as powerful at the setting of the sun as he is at the dawning of the day. At the close of Pentecost, there can be just as great a miracle He said, what do you have here? They said, we got four lo five loaves and three fish. Huh? What is that among so many? He said, set them down. Set them all down. You can sit down. <laughs> he said, set them down. Fifties and hundreds. He said, bring that five loaves and fishes to me. And he started blessing it and breaking it. And dividing it and giving out baskets and saying, get out there and feed the multitude. Come on, let's get out of this mentality, young people, that there's not other young people out there that want the Holy Ghost. There are teenagers out there that are fed up with alcohol in the home. They're fed up with drug addiction in the home. They're fed up. They're tired. They're weary with the life that they've been living. Amen. Their lives are so upside down. They are, have been raised in homes that are so dysfunctional that they don't even know hardly who their parents are. Extended families. Some of you may be here tonight in that state, but I'm going to tell you, when you get a hold of Jesus and you ever introduce them to Jesus, what a difference. What a difference. When you start telling them, he's more than enough. He's more than enough. He'll bring you out. Hey, I feel what I'm preaching in the Holy Ghost right now. Set them down. Fifties, hundreds. They went out and fed them. And whenever they got through, they came back and said, Lord, everybody has eaten. We have fed all of them. And I can hear them saying, with five loaves and three fish. Do you believe it? Can you believe it? Yeah, I can believe it because Jesus is always more than enough. I can sense tonight in the Holy Ghost that some of you are struggling with your faith right now. You are struggling with believing what this preacher is trying to preach to you. You are struggling with what I, there are adults here tonight that are struggling with this. It doesn't matter how many times you have risen and fallen. And it doesn't matter how many times you've given Bible studies and they haven't come. And you witness and you knock on doors. That doesn't mean we stop. We've got to come to a point where we understand that it's God. It's God, it's God who gives the increase. We plant the seed, we water, but it's God that gives the increase. You know what? You can be seated. If we don't believe what I'm preaching right now, we may as well shut the doors and go home. Everything God ever made, he gave it the power to grow. He put within it what, it was, what was necessary to reproduce. Woo, hallelujah to God. And he sure did not 
form and make and bring into being a church that at the end of the road she would somehow and please if you're in this state of physical condition i am not i am not speaking ill of your state but i'm telling you he didn't bring this thing into being uh, for it to walk out of here on crutches to ride in a wheelchair but the word of the lord said he's coming after a church that is glorious 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 Jesus said, all right, boys, I'm not done yet with this miracle. I am not finished with the lesson. Take those baskets and go out there and pick up all the fragments. You got to be kidding. Something's wrong now. But they went out, and when they came back, they brought 12 baskets full of fragments. <laughs> Ooh, hallelujah. I'm trying to tell you how Jesus does business. When church was over that day, there was more church left over. Than what they had when they started. Uh, oh Lord have mercy huh I said there was more left over more left over our problem sometimes is we close church down and we feel like we, we're like, we, we're like, like the old Maxwell house uh, 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 a coffee uh, 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 advertisement that they used to have good to the last drop and when we walk out we feel like we've drained it of every single thing that we could possibly get out of that service that is not the plan of God the plan of God is that when we leave church when we leave the house of worship there ought to be more power left in here there ought to be more glory residing there ought to be an atmosphere in the sanctuary more powerful more glorious more stronger than what it was when we walked inside those doors when we came inside the house I'm going to tell you why we need to have more than enough church. Because there will be people that are backslide. And whenever they find themselves in the pig pen, they need to be able to say like the prodigal son said. What servant in my father's house has bread enough and to spare. Those backsliders ought to be saying, I know where to go. I know where to go. Because when I left, they were having more church than they could handle. They were having more church than what they needed. When my God, When they left church, there was still some left over. I'm going to go back. That's the way Jesus operates. That's the way he operates. He operates saying you ought to have more when you come back than what you had when you came the first time. You'd have more power on your way to church. Hey, let me tell you something. Elisha had more power when he was dead in the grave than what some folks have walking around. Amen. 
Amen. You know, the reality is your pastors ought to have to flick the lights. All right, time to go home. Instead of going out in the foyer and saying, hey, young folks, we need to get back in church. Y'all need to be back in church. You ought to be flicking the lights and all right, time. And you ought to be saying, hold on, pastor. Got to have one more. I got to have one more. Oh, I wish I had time to preach the whole story tonight, but I don't. I'm just going to hit it real easy here. Now, no, I'm not going to preach a long time because I got friends over here that'll accuse me of preaching a six weeks revival in one night. They've already done it before. So I'm not going to do it. Come on, are there really some young people around here that are thinking, you know what, I heard what my grandma talked about. I heard what my grandpa talked about. I've heard the testimony of my pastor. I've heard the testimony of other preachers. I've heard the testimony of that white-haired sister on the sideline over there that can't hardly raise her hand, but she used to talk about all-night prayer meetings. And she used to talk about times when we couldn't go home. People laid out in the Spirit, drunk on the Holy Ghost, power of God. You didn't have to worry about sinners being in the house. Brother, when there's a fire big enough, they'll come find out what the fire's all about. Sit so down. You know what? Well, I'm feeling crazy and wild right now. I'm feeling so good. I know my wife's got to be home praying for me right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. You've heard me tell this story. Some of y'all have, so just close your ears. I'm getting old, so I get to repeat stories. Huh? Oh, Homer and Emma Lou riding down the road, driving. Emma Lou. Homer looking at one another. Homer looks over to Emma Lou and says, Emma Lou, he said, if I had a thousand eyes, they'd all be looking at you. Oh. <laughs> Rode a little while longer. He looked over and said, Emma Lou, he said, if I had a thousand arms, they'd all be hugging you. A few minutes later, he looks over. He says, Emma Lou, he said, if I had a thousand lips, they'd all be kissing you. She looked over at him. She said, Homer, shut your mouth and just use what you got. It's amazing to me how much we can do for God with what we don't have. And all God is saying, you got five loaves and three fish, bring them here. Just use what you've got. Just use what you've got. I'll make you a soul winner. I'll make you a witness. And so, Ruth and Naomi are on their way back to get back to Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread and the place of praise. And Ruth realizes it's, we're getting hungry. We've got to have something to eat. And so the Bible teaches us that she goes out. You can be seated. She goes out into the field 
The word of the Lord says she went out to glean in whose fields she might, whose eyes she might find grace. Oh, what a message. She wound up in the field of grace. And oh, what grace she found. I'm not preaching that. I'm just going to throw that out there. Amen. You get in the right field, friend. You quit fooling around with your sinner friends. You quit fooling around with your carnal friends. You quit playing footsies with the world. You quit flirting. You quit flirting with your own flesh. Come on. You get in the right field tonight. Some things can happen to you that's never happened to you in your life. She goes to glean. She's destitute. She's hungry, trying to find some measure of survival. And she finds herself in Boaz Field, not knowing where she was. And so out there, she's going through the field and she's picking up those handfuls that have been left or that gleanings that's been left by mistake. Oh, yeah. Not, not on purpose, just by mistake. Gathering up because the law was that when they gathered their sheaves in the field, if they dropped one, they couldn't reach down and pick it up. They had to leave it for the poor. They couldn't glean the corners or, or harvest the corners of their field. They had to leave it for the poor. And so she's out there getting stuff that was either left by mistake or things that they couldn't harvest. And she's gleaning. And Boaz, the owner of the field, steps out there and says, Who is that? Something about Ruth caught his attention. They said that's Naomi's daughter-in-law. Told the story. And Boaz went out to where she was and said, or he may have sent servants, whatever he did, he said, You tell her. And when she comes in, when the, when the harvesters, when the reapers come in, she's to come with them. And she's to sit at the tables where the reapers sit. And she is to drink from the water pots that the reapers drink from. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Oh, help me, Jesus. You know what they said to Boaz? They said that's Ruth, that Moabitish damsel. Her nationality followed her. The curse followed her. But Boaz did not let a color, a race, a nationality, a state of life, a, a condition... bias him against somebody that was in need. I got to hurry. I know this. I don't want to lose you. But the very minute that we start thinking that this church is designed for one group or for one color or for one nationality. Your little spirit of prejudice will shut your revival down. Because you're going to understand that God's more than enough for whoever they might be. <laughs> so he invited her to the table and that's what we ought to be doing with those that are hungry find you some young people that's not faring as well as you are and invite them to the master's table invite them to sit where you sit You know, sometimes one of the easiest things to do to help someone 
you got to you got to almost be like Ezekiel when he went down by the river of Shebar. If that's the proper pronunciation, if not, you can correct me later. But he said he went down by the river, and he said, "I sat where they sat." He sat where those who were in bondage sat. It didn't mean he joined them in their bondage. But he began to understand what they were going through by sitting where they sat. And ever now and then it wouldn't be so bad for you. In fact, I was in, I, I've been in foreign countries, I've been in third world countries and brother Calhoun, you've been there and there have been times that I've walked the streets and I've stood and I've looked at things and I've said, oh God, I know a generation of young Pentecostals. As a matter of fact, forget that. A young generation of Americans that are so given everything they want that need to spend about six weeks in a country like this and when they go home, they'll kiss American soil and they'll thank God for the freedom to worship. They'll thank God for their pastor. They'll thank God for their church. They'll thank God for the blessings that God's given them. Some of you have got more clothes in your closet than some of the Ethiopian apostolic young people would ever dream to have in a lifetime. And I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on you. I'm just trying to tell you, you're blessed. While, while I'm on that subject, I think there ought to be some young people around here in some of these churches that get together and say, you know what we ought to do? Let's go out and have a car wash and let's de designate the funds, not for another trip, not for another outing, not for something we want, but let's send the funds to a youth group in a foreign country that might need a little bit of help to have a revival, might need a little bit of help to see a move of God, that might need a little bit of help to have something that they've never had before. Let me move on here. I'm closing here in just a few moments. But Boaz, when they got up from eating, sent the servants back to the field, sent the reapers back out there. But before they left, he said, hey, boys, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, you see that Moabitish damsel? He said, when, when she's behind you, when you know she's behind you, he said, I want you to drop some handfuls of purpose. In other words, I don't want you to do it by accident. I want you to have it on purpose. Drop something on purpose. Handfuls of purpose. In other words, you, when you see her behind you, she's in need, you go ahead and do a little something extra. I don't think I'm stretching the limits of this scripture to say to this youth group here tonight, it's time for us to have a revival on purpose. Not by accident, but a revival on purpose. A revival in 2009 on purpose. On purpose. On purpose. On purpose. On purpose. I'm not talking about a revival where your pastor has got to constantly cheerlead you and constantly get you on your feet and constantly get you in the prayer room and stay on your case and do everything. It, oh, no. But a youth group that says, hey, pastor, hey, man, can you have some adults meet us at the church on Saturday night for a prayer meeting? Can you have some adults there to have us have an all night prayer meeting on Friday night? And so the scripture says that they did exactly that. And so when she goes to leave, Boaz, of course, encourages her. And she heads home. And here's the thing I want you to notice tonight. And that is that what she gathered, the scripture says she took it up. And she went in the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. Huh? 
saw what she had gleaned from the field. She saw that. But then the Bible said she brought forth and gave to her, Ruth gave to Naomi, that she had reserved after she was sufficed. Naomi saw what she had gleaned, what she had reaped. But Ruth said, hold on, that ain't all. She said, look at here. While I was at the master's table, when I got full, I started stuffing my pockets. Huh? Start saying. Come on, give me some bottles over there. Give me some water bottles. Ooh, I'm going home to where Naomi is. There's somebody back at home that's hungry. There's a mother in law that needs something else. I got my belly full. Huh? I got my belly full. I got what I needed. But I'm not leaving the king's table until I get some for Naomi. Until I get something for somebody else. I want more than enough. I said I want more than enough. I'm finished, but I've telling some young folks here tonight. I'm I'm calling on some young people to get you more than enough tonight. Before you walk out of winter heritage. Where's my help here tonight? Oh, don't you thank God for Sister Jones. Woo! Oh, what a preacher's wife. What a choir leader. What a singspirationist. What a musician. When you walk out of here tonight, you ought to be saying, Come on, give me some more. Give me some more. You haven't got any more. Give me another, give me another blessing. Oh, I'm so full. God's been so good to me at Winter Heritage. Come on, God. Give me another one. I got I got a friend named Jim at home. He needs the Holy Ghost. I got a sister back at home that she needs the Holy Ghost. I got a mom and daddy that needs the Holy Ghost. I got some friends at school I've been trying to get a Bible study with. Some of y'all want a a lock in. You want to go play. But the Holy Ghost tonight is saying, I'd like to give some young folks tonight more than enough. I'd like to send them home with more than what they've ever had. I want them to get beyond themselves. Give them more than enough. I want to give them enough to spread the word. They're getting ready to sing. And when they start singing, I want you to start worshiping. And I want you to start saying, Lord, give me more than enough. And when you feel like you've had enough, I want you to stop and say, okay, God, this one is for Sally back at home. This one's for my teacher at school. Everybody feel like I feel. We need some roots in the house that'll get you more than enough. That you go back home to your friends. You go back home to your family.
families. You go back home to your churches. You'll have more than enough for the ride home. You'll have more than enough. Somebody go! 